Hey guys, Nintendo here. Long before introducing their wildly popular miniature console to market, Nintendo tried their hand at selling a different kind of NES classics shortly after the launch of the Game Boy Advance SP. This of course was known to us in the States as the classic NES series for GBA. These little cartridges each hold one of a number of best-selling hits from the Big N's first-generation home console, and were made to commemorate the system's long and celebrated history. Just recently, I finished putting together the entire set of North American titles in this collection, and today we'll be taking a look back at each one, and I'll be answering your questions from social media about their history. So, let's get to it. Just before we get started, I've got to let you guys know that this video was made possible in part by my supporters over at Patreon. This week's featured patron is Mark Lavallo, and he had a major role in determining this episode's direction. So I want to give a big thank you to Mark and the rest of my lovely supporters on Patreon, as well as those of you who have chosen to hit that join button down below to help keep the channel going. You guys are the best. So here they are. This is my complete US set of classic NES series titles for Game Boy Advance. Each of these games represent one of the highest selling and most treasured titles for the Nintendo Entertainment System. We've got Super Mario Bros., Donkey Kong, Ice Climber, Excitebike, The Legend of Zelda, Pac-Man, Xevious, Bomberman, Metroid, Zelda 2, Dr. Mario, and Castlevania. A total of 12 releases in all. Unlike the vast majority of GBA games, these cartridges are a lighter gray color as an homage to their older and bulkier predecessors. Also as part of this 20th anniversary celebration, Nintendo released a limited edition NES-themed Game Boy Advance SP in the West, and a matching Famicom system over in Japan, as well as a Game Boy Micro in the color scheme of the Famicom controller released worldwide in the following year. Speaking of the Famicom, Japan saw a huge number of additional titles that we never got in the rest of the world. This collection was dubbed the Famicom Miniseries and offered a total of 30 games released in three separate waves, including Balloon Fight, Wrecking Crew, Dig Dug, Adventure Island, Ghosts and Goblins, Kid Icarus, and more. The packaging of these games is also significantly different from the US releases, and more closely resembles the packaging of their original counterparts. You can see here why they were called Famicom Mini. The colors of most of these cartridges are dual-toned red and white, once again to match the color scheme of the original Famicom. But other titles which were first released for the Famicom Disk System in Japan have a slightly modified packaging and were given bright yellow cartridges to match their original medium. One of the most common questions I got from you guys on social media was, what differences, if any, are there between the gameplay of these remakes and the originals? To answer that question, some of the titles in this lineup do have a few minor differences, but there are also some new features introduced for all of them across the board. Here are a few examples. Xevious originally required players to rapidly mash the fire button to shoot, but its GBA port introduced auto-fire to make gameplay a little easier. The Legend of Zelda famously had some poorly written text and spelling issues in its opening story, but the GBA version improved upon this translation with a modified intro, which has been included in every port of the game since. Oddly enough, the classic NES series release of Bomberman lacked the iconic multiplayer mode which the franchise is widely known for, and drew a bit of ire from a number of critics. Not all change is good, apparently. Interestingly, some of the more famous glitches in these titles remained untouched, like the Minus World glitch in Super Mario Bros. These were likely left in on purpose because they had significance to the culture and history surrounding the games. As far as new features overall, in order to keep these games multiplayer functionality intact, the GBA Link cables are supported for play across multiple systems. But on top of that, the classic NES series also supports a single cartridge multiplayer mode when using a pair of GBA wireless adapters, almost like an early version of the download play feature for Nintendo DS. Additionally, certain arcade titles which didn't originally support saving, such as Pac-Man and Donkey Kong, added permanent high score lists to match their arcade cabinet counterparts. And of course, each title is supported by the Game Boy Player peripheral for GameCube, meaning you can bring these titles back to their home on the big screen from the comfort of your couch. The biggest hurdle Nintendo had to overcome in bringing these games to the GBA might be easily overlooked, and that problem is a difference in screen resolution. Now, each title in the series does run on a proprietary emulator. They're not rebuilt from the ground up in any sense. But they didn't just add black bars to the sides or squish the entire picture down to compensate for the new, wider screen. 
This is evidenced by games like Zelda, where certain sprites are identical to the original game, but overall the scenes are adapted to fit this wider aspect ratio. See, the NES was capable of displaying 256 by 240 pixels of video, whereas the GBA screen has only 240 by 160 pixels of real estate. Now, for the width of the screen, that wasn't too big of a deal. Most NES games were designed with a safe zone border of around 16 pixels on each side to account for television overscan. So, the devs could simply discard the farthest 8 pixels on both sides with little consequence. For the height, however, things got a bit tricky. Because of the aforementioned safe zone, about 28 pixels could be safely cropped away without missing any crucial information, but that still leaves us with 212 lines, a 64 pixel difference in total from the target resolution. So, what did Nintendo do to solve that problem? Well, to start, they removed one out of every four horizontal lines of pixels from the final image to effectively squish that vertical resolution down to size. Then, they took certain layers of text and images, such as Link and the Octorox in this example, and made them exempt from that scaling filter. This results in a hybrid presentation in which characters and other crucial elements are drawn separately, while the rest of the game world around them is shrunk down to fit. Some games, like Super Mario Bros., also included new custom sprites to match the shorter screen height, so as to deliberately choose how they're displayed in cases where the original images wouldn't quite work. This might all seem like a bit of overkill, but Metroid in particular is a great example of why they went to so much effort to build this technique. As you might be aware, the GBA title Metroid Zero Mission includes a full version of Metroid for NES, which can be accessed after beating the game. This bonus game is scaled down in a very similar way, with every fourth line being discarded to fit the screen. But compared to the standalone release, you'll notice that certain sprites just look a lot worse and aren't quite as authentic to the original. This is because, for the classic series, the devs took the time to redraw certain elements so as to improve their appearance on the smaller display. When viewing them side by side, you can clearly see the advantage this brought to these titles. It's a little bit of polish that would largely go unappreciated to the average player. Another common question I saw was, are there any physical differences between the internal components of these NES classics and standard GBA game packs? Unlike when we did this for GBA video carts, it looks to me like the classic NES series games are built just like your standard GBA game. As far as I can tell, they're pretty much the same. However, there is more to them than meets the eye. Unlike a typical GBA game, these titles are notoriously difficult to emulate, or at least were up until fairly recently. As explained on the MGBA development blog, the classic NES series included a multitude of anti-emulation measures to thwart potential pirates, including accessing invalid memory addresses, pretending to load save data from non-existent locations, and even running game code directly from video RAM. Eventually, this was all documented and accounted for in late 2014, and the titles can be emulated today with no problem. But you've gotta wonder why Nintendo went to all this trouble for these ports in particular, especially when NES emulation had been pretty common and accessible since the mid-90s. Kinda weird. When these games were released, each title in the series retailed for $20 MSRP. This was significantly cheaper than the standard GBA game at 30 bucks, but players and critics alike were still pretty put off by the price for a number of reasons. For one, the e-reader accessory had come out a full two years earlier and offered its own collection of complete NES titles for just five bucks each. Granted, there wasn't a whole lot of overlap in the libraries, but when you could grab a copy of Donkey Kong, Ice Climber, and Excitebike for less money combined than a single standalone release, you can see how it would be hard to justify the extra cash. As mentioned earlier, some titles were also already present in other more popular releases, like Metroid being included in Metroid Zero Mission, and Pac-Man included with both Namco Museum and the Pac-Man Collection. But even so, that $20 price tag is nothing compared to some of their current values. While most games in the set are pretty common, two of them in particular are very sought after. They're both Japan exclusives, and were each produced as a promotional item alongside a related GameCube game. The first is Mobile Suit Z Gundam Hot Scramble, which was raffled off in a contest to owners of Mobile Suit Gundam Warriors Locus, and only saw a print run of 2,000 copies. This one sells for upwards of 300 US dollars at auction. The second title is Second Super Robot Wars, which was bundled with pre-orders of Super Robot Wars GC, and at the time of this video is valued at a whopping 1,000 US dollars. Now, if all that sounds a bit intimidating, do not worry. If you want to go for a complete US or European set, you'll find it's much more approachable. 
With only 12 titles in all, most of which sell for between 10 and 15 bucks, the Classic NES series is a great starting goal for both new and seasoned collectors alike. Alright guys, that's gonna do it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this showcase of the Classic NES series for Game Boy Advance. As always, if you did enjoy the video, please do consider subscribing to Nintendrew for all sorts of cool gaming content, and make sure to share it with any friends who might find it interesting. Otherwise, I'll see you next time. Bye! Hey guys, thanks again for watching and for making it all the way to the end of the video. If you like this one, here are two more videos you might like as well. As always, if you like what I do and would like to help out the channel, I've got a link to my Patreon on the right side of your screen. And otherwise, I hope you look forward to the next one. Take care!